Uh, today we are going to be talking about operating at scale and preparing for, for, for that journey with AWS. Um, this is the first introductory track uh, session in the, the track for today about operations and the, the different aspects to operations and, and how you work in the cloud. Um, uh, I'm here today with Isabel, and she's a technical account manager in Amazon, working in the support organization, as am I am. I'm Paul Moran. And uh, joining me on stage in a, a wee while is uh, William Fairbrother and Alan Cooper from uh, Skyscanner. Uh, and they're just going to share some of their experiences and insights into how they have operated at scale within AWS and how they onboard new workloads and the likes. So our goal for today, a clearer understanding of what operational excellence look, should look like for your organization. And that, it, it's quite simple really. It's to, to better understand what it looks like and how you plan for success within your, uh, your organization. And with that in mind, I'm just going to hand over to uh, Isabel. Thank you, Paul. So we are going to look at things through the lens of the well-architected framework. Um, for those that are not familiar, these are the five pillars. Um, we're going to start with security. Because security is the bedrock to everything that we do. And it should be baked in at every layer. It is a business enabler, and it should be viewed that way. It also covers reliability, because your products are important to your customers and your success. And reliable applications means that you can prevent and respond quickly to failure. Performance efficiency focuses on using IT and computing resources efficiently. And this means selecting the right resource types and sizes based on your workload requirements, monitoring performance, and making informed decisions to maintain efficiency as your needs evolve. Cost optimization focuses on avoiding unneeded costs. And this includes understanding and monitoring where your money is being spent selecting the appropriate and right number of resource types, scaling to meet business needs, and analyzing your spend over time. Operational excellence, it focuses on running and monitoring systems to deliver business value. It sits up on top of everything else, and it lays the foundations. And this is what we are here to talk about. So where do we start? <laughs> Let's lay some founding principles that best support success. So in the cloud, you can apply the same engineering disciplines that you use for your application codes to your entire environment. You can design entire workloads, and that is your security, your infrastructure, your application stacks, as code, and updated with code. You can script your operation procedures and automate their execution. And this will avoid the immediate need of human action. This will also limit human error and will provide consistent responses to events. And these processes should be always iterated upon. So, in an on-premises environment, documentation is created by hand, is used by humans, and it's hard to keep in sync with the pace of change. In the cloud, you can automate the creation of annotated documentation after every build. Or you could automatically annotate your handcrafted docu documentation. Annotated documentation can be used by humans and systems. You can use annotations as an input to your operations code. And remember, tagging is your friend. The metadata that you can build at AWS, thank you, <laughs> at AWS is critical to your success. So you should design your workload so that their components can be updated regularly and make changes in small increments so that they can be reverted if they fail, and when possible, without affecting customers. A good approach is decoupling services. A good method 
is the microservices approach. You can also use serverless functions. So as we all know, everything fails all the time. So doing things like pre-mortem exercises will help you identify potential sources of failure so that they can be removed or mitigated. Testing your failure risk scenarios will validate your understanding of their impact. Testing your response procedures will ensure they are effective and that the teams are familiar with their execution. Setting up regular game days will allow you to test your workloads and the team responses to simulated events. And you can look at these events to extract lessons to improve and enrich your documentation and processes for a better outcome. So think about our customer, Netflix. They built Chaos Monkey and a whole Simeon army. And this help, helps them build confidence in their system capabilities to withstand any condition. So I don't want to finish this section without talking about lessons learned. You can drive improvement by extracting lessons from all operational events and failures and share those lessons across all teams through the entire organization. And don't forget to bake in the response to those lessons back into your processes. And now back to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So uh, as, a, as a part of operating in the cloud, you, you, you've got to prepare your operations, you've got to, to run those operations, and then you've got to evolve those operations once you're, uh, once you're more, more secure in what you're doing. So preparing. What, is that, what does preparing really mean? It, it means understanding the direction of travel. And for that, you need to understand what your priorities are. They're going to be driven by your business. This, this understanding then has to be uh, baked into all of your teams. It has to be the, the business sponsors that understand it, your operational teams, your dev teams, and you have to see it from an end-to-end -end perspective. You need to design with operations in mind, and you've got to ensure that you're your workloads and your teams are ready for operating at scale in the cloud. Operate means living in the cloud, taking your stack, your application, your product, uh, and, and actually living on a day-to-day -day basis. You run your standard operating procedures. You collect vast amounts of data about uh, what your customers are doing, and you respond to the events that, that arise. And whilst you're o operating in there, you want to automate as much as possible. Evolve, well, that, that means that you're continuously improving, that you're, you're adapting to your environment, your customer needs, the, the, the business demands. You've got valuable business data in your operational logs. You, you can build a picture of trend. You can look at ways of simplifying your processes. You can look at ways of automating further with, with the use of this data. Uh, and you can look at improving your alerting and uh, identify areas that, that can, can benefit from constant improvement. Operations collects uh, metrics that are are used to measure the achievement of desired business outcomes on a, uh, a, a global basis within your organization. Uh, and they can provide really valuable and actionable business insights back to the, the, the people who are designing your products and, and engaging with your customers. And it's, it's important to design operations to support evolution of that process over time in response to change, to growth, to the various lessons that you learn, to, to your customer demands, all of those kind of things. Right now, we're just gonna, we're gonna double down on, uh, on prepare and, and what are the considerations to, to bear in mind when you're starting to bring workloads to the cloud. So setting your operational priorities. Uh, th this one's, it's, it's really important because uh, it, it, it sets your starting point. So you've gone through that, that mass migration, uh, you've pulled all your applications over to the cloud, you've, you've reached that kind of epoch point, uh, and now you've got to, to live in the cloud. 
Um, so your teams need to have a shared understanding of, of that entire workload, their role in how that workload operates, and what the shared business goals are in that scenario. And that helps set the priorities that will enable business success. Part of that picture is considering things like uh, external regulatory bodies. So if you're a government or a financial service or uh, another regulated industry, take into account what those regulatory bodies have to say. But also that can be an internal compliance need. So lessons learned from previous experience before coming to AWS means that you, you're bringing that experience in and getting that baked in as early as possible. Use your priorities to focus your operational improvement efforts where they have the greatest impact. So you're avoiding an outage, you want to look through your data and analyze that data, get an indicator of what a failure looks like, and be able to respond to it before it really takes hold. Developing teams, improving workload performance, automating run books, enhancing monitoring, all of those are good candidates for raising the operational priorities. But don't forget, your priorities need to be updated as your business changes. And AWS can help you with uh, educating your teams about the AWS serv services that we've got out there. And we can help you with understanding how your operational choices have an impact on your workload. So feel free to talk to any of the guys that are out there today. The Well Architect is standing downstairs. Uh, we've got all sorts of operational booths just out, out here. Um, and there's, there's sessions being run in here all day. Supporting resources in this space. Uh, AWS Cloud Compliance is a collection of tools that allow you to layer in and, and measure your compliance standards for your estates, and that, whether that be uh, a compliance statement from uh, one of our auditors or tools that help you build your own compliance statement for internal audit, third party, that kind of thing. Trusted Advisor is a greatly underappreciated tool. It, it gives you a wide range of details regarding cost optimization, about performance, security, fault tolerance, service limits, uh, and it's embedded in the console. So get looking at it and, and, and get a deeper insight as to, to what your accounts look like. One of the key aspects of uh, defining your operational priorities is, is engaging with enterprise support or AWS support. Um, and when you're bringing in your your production and your business critical workloads, business and enterprise support are, are, are there to, to provide that extra layer of assurance. So different aspects of, uh, of enterprise support. There's basic support level. Basic support provides access to the global support organization with knowledge in uh, depth and breadth. You get access to 24-7 customer services. There are support forums. Uh, you get uh, support for health checks and access to documents, white papers, all of those kind of things. Building on that, developer support. You get all of those things, plus email for technical support, uh, a name contact, and as well as your 24-hour response time, you can now get a 12-hour response time. Business support is targeted at customers who are looking to, to bring on uh, production workloads into AWS. And as well as uh, all, the, all of the other stuff, you get email, phone, chat, screen sharing with technical support. You get a response time of a, an hour for your urgent requests. And uh, support for third party software like uh, Apache configs. So we'll not fix code, but we'll help you work through your problems. And you get greater insight and depth of, uh, of your estate through Trusted Advisor uh, and access to support APIs. With enterprise support, you get access to all of those, plus you get a technical account manager. And uh, you can then have critical case management. That's 15 minutes response time. You get access to uh, a wider variety of enterprise support um, technology launches and, and, uh, and assistance with, uh, with, with your own estate. Um, and one of the things I'd like to call out on that front is infrastructure event management. So infrastructure event management is uh, an option where you can say, and this is available as a paid option within enterprise, in business support, as well as included in enterprise support. Um, and infrastructure event management will 
provide that, that assurance and assistance for a big bang migration. Or you've got a peak event through the year, it's a Black Friday, a Christmas, a Valentine's Day thing. You want someone to, to, to be there and help you with your estate and, 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 and keep an eye on things. Fills that gap. And uh, if you want to more, know more details about the support, there's a link there. So, designing with operations in mind. The design of your workload should include how it will be design, design, deployed, updated, and operated. So it's, it's, it's moving some of your processes to the left in the, in, in the whole piece. It's taking it up front and saying, right, um, traditionally, we've, we've designed our application, and then we hand it off to somebody to, to run for us. It's actually saying, well, I, can we take a step back? And can we implement all of those good engineering practices that we've got baked around our applications? And, and factor that into our operational practice. So you've got the seamless piece going across the, the full life cycle of your, your deployments. And this means that you can, uh, you can understand what, what's happening within your architecture. Um, you, you get deeper insights with, with the logging because your, your, your teams are working together and, and not only they're understanding the application, but they're understanding the outcomes. And that means that you can c turn your data into something that can create actionable information with business insights. And this should be as natural as any other part of your design processes. And in AWS, as Isabel said before, you can view your entire workload, your applications, your infrastructure, your policy, your governance, your operations, all of those things as code. And it can be defined in and updated by using code. This means that it can apply the same disciplines across the, the piece, as we said. It also means that you can take things like tags, metadata, and apply that to your operational practice. And it, that'll enable you to identify your resources for your operational activities. Tags help in so many different situations. Uh, you can use them to uh, add extra dimensions to your estate. So uh, AWS Answers has a really good document on uh, how to build out scheduling for your estate. You have a development environment. You tag your development environment as that. And you can schedule that environment to be built up and then shut back down again. Equally, you can uh, use it to identify who that development environment's for. Or do some cost analysis and say, right, with those tags, I'm looking at uh, what, what business unit or, or, or squad or tribe is, is looking at your uh, spinning up your estate and, and making that work for you. Also ensure that you publish any of those business metrics that you're, you're collecting as part of your operational practices back to your business. And that, that means technical metrics as well. And they'll help you understand what your customers are doing and their behaviors and their impact on your estate. The next session in this room is, uh, design, is designing with ops in mind. So if it's something that's interest to get a, a deeper dive, stick around or come back in here after uh, we've finished up. Supporting resources in this space, CloudFormation, allows you to create version controlled standardized templates for your infrastructure. And it underpins the automation and, and repeatability of your deployments. And Skyscanner are going to talk a bit more about that later on. There's a variety of AWS development tools that will uh, help you enable rapid and safe delivery of software. And that's tools like code commit, code build, code deploy, those kind of things. Um, and with X-Ray, uh, you can see a, a request travel through your whole application stack and get some real in-depth views of, of what your, your customers are doing with your applications. Operational readiness. Uh, this, th th this part is it, it's the, it's the build-up to going live. It's, it's, it's using all those consistent processes that you've started to, to, to create, automating where you can, have run books, playbooks, checklists, those kind of things. Um, and this way, you know that with a great deal of certainty when you're ready to go live. You've, you've run through your checklists, your playbooks uh, match what your expected responses are, your run books, exactly the same. Those run books, uh, they document your routine activities, your day-to-day -day operational tasks. Your playbooks, they guide your processes for issue resolution. 
So how are you going to respond to a particular event? A big part of that is, is uh, the people factors. So you, you need to have enough team members to cover all of your operational uh, activities, things like on call, and being able to have draw down on run books and playbooks for those operational activities is really, really important. Training is a critical part of that. Training on AWS, training on your workload, and training on your operational tools is essential for those teams that are involved. And AWS allows you to treat your operations as code, so script your runbooks, script your playbook activities. It reduces the risk of human error, but also it, it frees up people in those critical times to know that the list of activities are, are greatly reduced. They have fewer spinning plates to, to run through, and if it's automated, they know that that, that automated response is, is tried and tested. And once again, don't forget to tag. And don't forget also that you can spin up environments on demand so that you can test all of those things uh, and in a completely disposable way. Uh, and in that space, game days are absolutely essential. So setting up a, a game day that will allow you to, uh, uh, to, to, to test not just your application stack, but your responses, how teams interact, uh, build up a camaraderie across teams as well. Supporting resources in this space, AWS Config, uh, that can help track changes through your cloud formation stacks. And with Config rules, you can, uh, you can evaluate whether they're, they're compliant. And you can actually roll back a, a, an estate as, as part of that, because they, they've not met a minimum standard for you. EC2 System Manager is a collection of capabilities that it helps you automate uh, tasks on your uh, EC2 instances patching, all of those kind of things. So what does success look like? Uh, I, I like this one because, well, success is defined by your business. It's, it, it's a, an outcome that is part of your operational requirements. And operations are there to su support that kind of success. You're delivering for your customer, your users. You're doing it all in a timely fashion. And it comes in, in many forms, but it's always driven by your business priority, by your customer's needs. So it could mean that you're taking a, uh, you measure it by taking a, a, a set of metrics across a year, or there is a, a particular peak point that you, you, you have to succeed against. Uh, but measure that and publish that, because that's, that's still valuable business information. I think ultimately, though, experience has taught me that operations uh, is simply that your processes work, that, that things run, that you respond well, and that nobody notices that you've had that outage because you've automated, you've practiced, you understand your estate. And if there are failures, no one can tell because your operations just continue. And also if there are failures, you learn from them and you build on them. There's also a lot of external factors to take into account. Uh, the, the things that you wouldn't always necessarily consider as part of a, a, an operational excellence piece. Um, but here is just a few of them. Um, Isabel? Thank you. So culture can have a big influence. Supporting new approaches will have a powerful impact. So look at new technologies as a means to releasing up resources, to focus better on the job at hand. Having a healthy approach to change and new technologies means that you understand your environments. And it will help you adapt quickly and confidently in those environments. So don't fear constraints and changes in circumstances, because that means you have that understanding. So empower your teams. People who share in the benefit of the outcome have greater ownership. I'll avoid that side. <laughs> so teams that work like this, they, they are responsible and accountable for the services that they run. Another thing to remember is to support experimentation, because innovation comes from experimentation. Oh, we will have a panel session later today. Uh, it's called Culture Eats a Strategy for Breakfast. 
And we will talk to a number of customers who have great experience in running mission critical production workloads with AWS. So if you're interested in culture, don't miss it. Uh, back to us. Culture is made by your values and your behaviors. But your values have only meaning if they are backed up by the proper behaviors. So successful cultures are, are focused on hiring skilled people who are then empowered to own the products. Doing things like infrastructure as code and continuous delivery and having developers on call who can resolve any issues that arise, it creates ownership. And it actually starts to look a lot like DevOps. So all of these things in Amazon crystallize around our leadership principles. You can Google them. The leadership principles are at the heart of our culture and help us build a healthy approach to deliver services to our customers. Our behaviors reflect the leadership principles, and the leadership principles support our behaviors. Everything we do starts with the customer, and it works backwards. Thank you. Thank you. So th think products. Don't think, uh, so pro projects live for defined periods of time. They've got deadlines, they've got fixed costs. Products, they're, they're ongoing. Products have life. Uh, they exist beyond the immediate horizon. They're measured on business value, not just a, a defined cost with, with a variable scope, uh, scope creep or shrinkage. Uh, and, and products evolve with your business and your customers. So don't just think in terms of this piece of work here, think in terms of the bigger piece, picture. Over to you. Oh, Secu yeah, just keep it. Uh, security, I'm gonna repeat it. Security should be baked in at every layer. You should be able to trust your stacks. So security, it is a business, thank you. <laughs> it's a business enabler, and it's, it's not something to be feared. So knowing, uh, knowing your state and Monitoring your network, your applications, your systems for security-related activity. It means that you understand what is happening, and it will give you the confidence to keep growing. So you can use compliance tools like Macy and GuardDuty, and they will give you deep insights into your services. You could also use machine learning to identify patterns and trends in your data for example, for fraud detection. Um, or you could also ask one of our solution architects here today to build these powerful tools of, impact, of insight. Openness is another, no, oh, on the back, <laughs> no, ah, there we uh, Openness, that's a, it's another big part of, uh, of the picture. Um, openness can lead to innovation. Sharing knowledge stimulates growth. It, it creates freedom of, 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 of knowledge across an organization. Uh, and, and it kind of it empowers individuals within teams to, to kind of step up and, and do what they, they, they need to do for the organization. It also lays the foundations for, for learning, learning from each other, learning from experiences, learning from failure. Uh, openness and failure are two things that, that are, are great bedfellows. It can also provide a stepping stone to the next phase as you develop and grow and, and, and keep moving your estate forward. Also, responsibility and accountability are a big part of the openness pi picture, uh, and, uh, and with them come visibility. Visibility is it's critical across a business function. Isabel. I'm going to be quick. <laughs> big change means big governance. <laughs> small incremental change means a small governance. So continuous delivery will help you reduce the risk and improve the quality of your products. So, never stop iterating. Start your journey, plan it, build, run, review, start all over again. It's, it's a, a, an ever-increasing cycle that means that you're improving the quality of your outcomes every single time. And lessons learned from one part of your operational practice and apply to another is, is absolutely invaluable. And uh, I, I just, I, I like this quote because it's really pertinent to, 
to the, those of us who work in a, a, an operations world. Don't let the failures of today be the reasons for failure of tomorrow. Build on those lessons that you've learned, sometimes the hard way, but, but use that lesson and move things forward. Now, I would like to introduce uh, William Fairbrother and Alan Cooper from uh, Skyscanner, just to share some of their experiences of, uh, of how they have operated in the cloud and, uh, and some of the challenges that they've met. Over to you guys. I'll give you the uh, clicker. Thank you. So I'm Alan Cooper. I, I've been with Skyscanner since 2012, originally as the infrastructure manager, um, responsible for building out those uh, legacy, as they're now called, data centers, and for the last two or three years been involved in driving, moving the estate from those data centers into AWS. Hi, and I'm William Fairbrother, and I'm an engineering manager with Skyscanner, previously a squad lead for cloud operations and working around containers and uh, AWS for about the last three to five years. Um, Today we've got a couple of slides just to provide some insight and information about some aspects of uh, preparing for using cloud at scale that you might find helpful. Okay, as a, as a quick overview, um, at the moment we're doing about 70 million active users per month. Um, we've got in the region of five to five and a half million sessions per day as a max, 30 languages, 150 currencies. Uh, we do 11 billion plus uh, value bookings per annum. And obviously we're available on iOS, Android, desktop, and we have business to business channels. We kicked off our journey around three years ago, um, operating uh, four regions that map to our global data centers with Direct Connects in a hybrid mode, and we're still in hybrid mode now. Um, we still have links between some applications and the data center, but we have um, successfully migrated a number of production workloads into cloud, and we have had a number of learnings throughout that journey. So one I'd like to call out specifically was related to um, the management of traffic running between regions. We uh, employ Akamai as a global traffic management tool and for content delivery. So historically, we've had uh, quite a good story on being able to uh, you know, drain data centers or drain regions to perform maintenance. But one of the things I think you need to be aware of is that if you've got a very big load and you're having to um, migrate walls of traffic between regions, then you should really be ready to test it out properly and be ready to pre-warm and understand the impact on your services that these kind of events have. Uh, we run um, multiple production workloads, I'll call it a few of them. Uh, we have a price alerts engine, we have our data acquisition engine, we have live update and pricing systems, and we're moving hopefully all of it by the end of the year into AWS. Um, we use many different services, ECS, we've got a Kubernetes cluster that runs on EC2 that we baked ourselves. Obviously, we consume a lot of EC2, we use a bit of Lambda, and um, a lot of these services are very scalable and the kind of things that you're gonna have to think about, you know, your choices to use when you end up in the cloud. So here's a fairly simple graph. Um, one of our big systems in AWS uh, runs at up to 10 million requests per minute. Um, that's all running in EC2 through NAT instances, uh, which Alan's going to talk about later on in more detail, because we've got quite uh, big ones and there, we had a few challenges in getting those scaled effectively. Um, so one of the things you might want to think about if you're not in AWS already is how do you plan for your users to smoothly interact with AWS? We had um, a number of learnings there because when we started, we didn't really think about this very well. Um, in my opinion, you probably don't want all your users logging into AWS. You may want to think about how effectively you'd like them to interact around it using deployment tools. Um, you want to think about how they can smoothly get onto the AWS CLI to only use their resources in a safe manner. You may wish to think about 
a slick 2FA solution to get them logged in effectively. It's worth uh, investigating a number of these options because at scale with lots of people, if there's any, uh, you know, the number, the number of requests that can be generated for support and help to get on around these things can suddenly turn uh, a reasonably, you know, stable squad into a particularly overstretched one that aren't enjoying what they're doing because they're overwhelmed with requests. Um, also, uh, Paul spoke something about, he spoke about cloud formation and been able to actually deploy uh, consistent repeatable infrastructure as code through your states or your accounts or your regions, where, where, where we want to sort of dice it up. Now, we have a bit of a, a story on that one because initially we, we failed with that. Um, we thought initially that you know, it would be great for, our, for the, the cloud operations guys who'd skilled up in AWS to make sure that all the code was going out that was right, there was no bad groups, there was no badly formed roles, and we took it upon ourselves to, to meet that challenge and were soon overwhelmed by the number of developers who were interested in pumping out more infrastructure as code every day of the week. So suddenly we realized that we'd have to try and scale that somehow without, throughout the organization, and we picked a select bunch of people we thought were well, well up on their AWS, and gave them the rights to go and deploy as well. And suddenly we found that the things weren't quite as consistent as we'd like them to be, and that it didn't really solve the problem of deploying CloudFormation at scale safely or in a very controlled fashion. So we had to then iterate again upon that process, and eventually we ended up with um, a partially automated system that checks cloud formation for badly formed roles automatically. We'll alert upon that and automatically roll back if those scenarios exist. But also then, incre incrementally still, we have utilized uh, SWF and get to make a system called Slingshot, which we can now use to deploy thousands of times a day if required throughout all our regions. So in terms of planning your deployment strategy, I think some people might have tool sets in their data centers and organizations they currently use that just won't really work too well if they're jammed in. So have a good think about whether you want to use native AWS tools or if you need to build something custom or if you wish to leverage something else. It might be the safest and most effective way to actually build something that makes it safe to deploy and you know, takes the permissions and the risk factor out of the hands of the end developer. Um, training's another story. We, we, that we have, we, we started off trying to make sure that all of our uh, focused cloud operations engineers were at least running it around, you know, the systems ops associate certified level. And we, we got training from AWS and we got training from other third parties and online things. One of the challenges is that people come, people go, people join the organization, the tool set changes. So it's not a one sort of one shot or a silver bullet you can take to the training issue, you have to actually continue to train and as the tool sets evolve, work with those as well to make sure the people are proficient in their uh, capabilities to deliver. So moving on, um, living with limits, I'm not sure if anyone's hit a limit, I'm sure you have. Uh, we've got a good story in this, we understand our limits and graph them through the Trust Advisor APIs. We deal with it effectively and quickly when we, when we hit a limit and you know, learn the lessons and where we have to go for other accounts that we spin up. When it comes to uh, account structure and design, oh sorry, on the subject of capacity, um, I'm sure everyone's thought about reservations. You know, do you have standard reservations, region specific reservations? Do you blend reservations with on demand and spot? So clearly everyone has events and busy periods in their organization, maybe every week, maybe once a year, but you have to understand when you're going to need capacity and where you need it and reserve that correctly. So in terms of um, account structure and design, we uh, looked to have a structure. We, we, we realized that we needed to be secure and log our data to the correct place, i.e. not a place. You know, we didn't want to lose our audit logs. So we, we make sure that we've got accounts specific for billing. We've got a you know, warm standby, data backup, a log account. So if you look at your account structure and what you need to have, probably one account isn't going to work and you need to think about how many accounts to work, to work effectively at scale. Um, 
I'm not sure if anyone looks at their AWS bill every week, but I think you need to also to work at scale effectively and not burn a hole in your checkbook. Make sure that you have a, a focus on uh, spending and having regular reviews on costs is very important. Um, we, we, we started off using the AWS native billing, putting that into Redshift and then crunching reports out of that, which is quite good. And I think it's getting better with some of the new billing features. But to operate a scale effect, for us to operate a scale effectively, we ended up looking at Cloud Health Tech and some other tools, which gave us some very good insight into uh, savings and optimizations and right sizing, which are all key factors to operating the scale but not, not making yourself bankrupt. So we learned a lot of lessons regarding cost early. You know, things like cost of big NAT gateways, using endpoints for everything, making sure your IOPS and volumes are there. There's a long list of things that you can do smart to make sure your costs work for you. In terms of security, uh, I think we've had the message from our TAMs here that baking into every layer is important. So secret management, certificates, looking at um, security groups, account policies, roles, all these things are fundamental to making sure that you can run secure applications at scale. Also securing your perimeters regarding um, good VPC config ECLs and data center uh, and office you know, firewalling. Lots of talk about an IAM policy generation supporting wizards. Um, we could talk about that a lot for quite, quite a long time today. Probably not enough time to go into it because I think we're running behind schedule. But the other security initiatives we have included things like ECR image scanning, code scanning to look for things like keys, making sure that when someone does deploy CloudFormation that it's all checked for like action star, resource star, making sure people understand to use granular, granular policies and least, you know, least uh, privilege permission models. So I'm going to hand you over to Alan, who's going to delve into a couple of these, R these subjects in more detail as well. So <clears throat> I don't think anything what I'm going to say today is going to be a surprise, but it's always worth, worth reiterating. Um, you can't do it all yourself. Don't have a centralized operation system that have to turn the handle for scale for your users to, to work. Uh, reason for that. You're moving into AWS, you want to succeed. If you succeed, you grow. Skyscanner went from 200 to about 400 engineers over the space of about 18 months, two years. That's a lot of, a lot of people to onboard, skill up, do things right. Um, not knowing how you're going to do that is OK. Iterate. Don't let perfect be the, avail the enemy of available. Get tooling out, doesn't need to be perfect, but as long as it does the job and addresses the pain points that you've got in, got at hand. And standardization is key. As uh, Paul said earlier, CloudFormation makes a huge difference compared to hand-cranked uh, configurations because as you scale up, add more engineers, the knowledge transfer of why a hand-cranked system is the shape it is and how to make, how to make changes um, becomes a real pain point. Um, within Skyscanner, we built the world's least impressive web page internally, which was a self-service portal. Um, this was to address a lot of the issues that, that William alluded to earlier around um, onboarding, getting people trained up. Um, this was a primarily boto based system um, and what that does is that drives the project creation process which is how new services get set up within Skyscanner. That then takes care of tagging, it then takes care of enforcement because it's, it's a glue point where you've got metadata that you can link into other systems. It also means that the squads can do things like reset their own passwords, create roles that they can then assume in production to do um, various operational tasks. Um, and it also looks into a lot of other cost management tools, um, documentation systems, so that you've got a kind of one-stop shop. Um, and Boto's been a, a, an amazing tool to rapidly iterate on getting these, things, these tools ready for, for teams. Um, sorry, 
slide behind. It's not, uh, so that, that's the organisational scale challenges. We also have some more technical challenges um, as things, things grew. Um, one of the biggest systems that we actually first moved into AWS was our data acquisition systems, i.e. the bits that actually go out and get the prices for your flight. Currently, that system is running at roughly 45 gigabits per second, which is a lot. Um, originally, we were running this just on as pre-managed NAT gateways. We had a lot of challenges around um, EC2 stability, um, and more importantly, when issues happened, people had to scrabble to fix them. EC2 boxes need rebooted, need replaced, lost an EBS volume, or things that, that jumped to mind. So we addressed that by looking at what we could do to automate that. Um, and we took a pressure released valve approach where we carefully um, gathered all the metrics around um, the, the EC2 instances. Um, and from that, we had then had CloudWatch alarms driving Lambda functions. The Lambda functions, in turn, allowed us to take emergency action instantly, so people weren't getting woken up. Um, we could fail over to standby NAT instances when managed NAT came out. That that gave us additional uh, failover capabilities, and I'm being given time notifications. So, um, scale first, cost second. Um, worry about how it's going to go, how, how it's going to be reliable, worry about the cost second. Um, and just to I'll hand back over to William. Thanks. Okay, we're almost out of time. Just a couple of final thoughts. Uh, don't think for any organization it's very, good, it's very, it's very, uh, very achievable to get everything right first time. So be prepared to fail fast and fail forward. There's lots of uh, opportunities to learn and hopefully you enjoy your, your journey. It doesn't become, you know, so you can still keep it fun. Uh, change happens and be ready to respond to it as it does. Thanks very much for your time today. And if you've got any queries for Alan, I feel free to get in touch. Thank you, uh, thank you William. Thank you, uh, Alan. Um, bunch of links here related to the various resources we talked about. I like to call it the two at the bottom, uh, AWS Answers and our GitHub repo. There's a lot of valuable information in there. The GitHub repo has got all sorts of code that you, so you don't, just don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, thank you, Skyscanner, for, for uh, sharing your experience. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>